do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Isaiah 43, 18 through 19. Welcome to our fall relaunch revival. On behalf of our pastor, Reverend Patrick Damon, thank you for joining us. We are overjoyed that you choose to join us in this spiritual renewal. We pray that you feel God's move wherever you are. Feel free to clap, sing, shout, and talk back to us in the comments. Again, we feel so very blessed that you have chosen to spend time with us and hope that you return again. Let us pray. Oh, most gracious and wonderful Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this time of renewal. We welcome you into this place, dear Lord. Dwell with us, Lord. Touch every heart and every mind of every person that is here and present with us, Lord. Give them space, give them room, give them the ability to hear the word clearly, Lord. We ask that you bless their households, Lord. Let that be a spirit of calm, Lord, so they can hear what the preacher is saying, Lord. We ask that you bless the minister today. We ask that you cover their hearts, their mind, and their spirit, and let the words of their mouth and the meditation of their heart truly be acceptable in your sight, Lord. Lord, we thank you. We give you praise, the honor, and the glory. In the matchless, marvelous, and magnificent name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We are grateful for the blood of Jesus shed on the cross at Calvary. Thank you. And this song reminds us that it reaches to the highest mountain yeah. and flows to the lowest valley. Come on. Praise team, talk about that blood. Say it again. Oh, the blood that Jesus shed for me. Way back on Calvary. Way back on Calvary Shall never lose its power Shall never lose its power The blood that signed my name The blood that signed my name Say it at home, all oh, the blood This is the part I am cleansed because I am cleansed because uh, of the blood. I like this. Just say, Oh, the blood. That Jesus shed for me. Way that it is back on Calvary. Way back on Calvary. Shall never lose its power. Come on. Shall never lose its power. How many know it's that same blood that signed your name? The blood that signed my name. How many know it's the blood that Jesus shed for you and me? Oh, oh, the blood. I am cleansed because I am cleansed because, because of the blood. This is the part right here. Say it to yourself. It reaches. It reaches. Say it again together. Oh, 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 o
I am cleansed because I am cleansed because of the blood. How many know it reaches, it reaches to the highest, to highest mountain? This is the first night of our relaunch revival. I can't tell you how excited I am as we seek God for what God is calling us to become in this season that puts a demand on the church, not simply to reopen, but redeploy and relaunch into something new. And coming out of these summer months, sometimes we need to get refocused, recharged and refreshed so that we can finish the year in a strong way. And we have a preacher tonight who is going to help us to do just that. He is none other than the Reverend Dr. Charles Goodman, senior pastor of the Tabernacle Baptist Church in Augusta, Georgia. Pastor Goodman is a phenomenal and sought after preacher, teacher and revivalist who has trained both in head and in heart. His education is stellar. His credentials are superb. He has several degrees, including his doctor of ministry degree, and is currently pursuing a PhD in leadership. He has led Tabernacle in astounding spiritual and numerical growth, serving over 10,000 worshipers on a weekly basis across multiple locations. He is one who has been called to empower and encourage the people of God 
as he travels the world proclaiming the word of God in practical and applicable ways. And I know that he's got a ready word for us on tonight. Church, as we prepare to receive the word of God, it's time to bring our offering for this evening. We're excited to sow into the kingdom work that goes forth from this ministry. And because of all the tragedies that we have seen in recent days outside the bounds and the borders of our locality, the Lord has placed on my heart that we're going to use our revival as an opportunity to be a blessing and to donate to relief efforts down in Haiti, Louisiana, Mississippi, along the Gulf Coast, and those areas that have been affected by Hurricane Ida. So we ask tonight that you give from your heart as we go above and beyond our regular tithes and offerings to be a blessing to those who are in need. So as we go to God, would you repeat after me? Lord, I thank you for all that I have. I recognize that every good and perfect gift comes from you. You've already blessed me in amazing ways. Now I want to give and be a blessing to those in need. So erase the amount I would normally give and write on my heart that would you have me to sow. You say it and I'll give it because I can't beat you giving no matter how I try. In Jesus name, amen. Again, we thank God for your generosity on tonight. Right now, I would ask that you prepare your hearts and minds to hear the word proclaimed by the Reverend Dr. Charles Goodman. Covenant, let's welcome the preacher and be blessed. Grace and peace, I pray that God has been an amazing creator and sustainer for you in your life. Once again, to the Covenant UCC Church, it is an incredible opportunity for me to come and to share in this revival. I am praying that God's choices, blessings will continue to surround you and keep you. And once again, we also give a major shout out to your incredible pastor, Pastor Patrick, who I'm so grateful to have a friendship with, the brotherhood, and so grateful for the work that God is doing in him, even in the midst of this pandemic. And I really appreciate this invitation. There is honor whenever someone who heads this amazing tribe of believers uh, opens up their pulpit, whether it's in person or virtual. And so once again, Pastor Patrick, thank you again and to your family and to the leadership of the Covenant UCC Church. It is just a joy to be able to share with you as we kick off this revival. Listen, I am Dr. Charles E. Goodman Jr. from the Tabernacle Baptist Church in Augusta, Georgia. And once again, we bring you greetings all the way from L.A. And so lovely Augusta is what we call it. And we're so appreciative. Appreciate this opportunity to share with you and praying for you as we know you are praying for us as all of us are navigating these uncertain times. What is it that God would have for us to hear today? What would God be able to speak to us in our current situation? Well, as we prepare our hearts, I want to center us in a word of prayer. And I pray no matter where you are and wherever you're listening or tuning in to, I pray that once again we will be refocused and we will make sure that we are imagining all the possibilities that God has for us every single day. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the precious privilege to be able to share. We honor you for your love and your dedication that you extend towards us. I thank you for this incredible church. I thank you for this amazing pastor. And now, God, it's our time to hear a word from the Lord. And Lord, I'm praying, God, that you will use me as a vessel that is once again open and available. I pray now, God, that people are blessed and transformed and helped. And I pray that through the word of God, we are made better. Once again, we are relaunching, excited to see what the next side will be as we move into the next normal. But God, I pray that today's word would once again put us in the right perspective and make us prioritize what we need to prioritize. This is our prayer. In the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. Well, let's get to work, guys. Turn to me to Genesis chapter 8. I'm reading from the New Living Translation, but as long as your book says Bible, you are absolutely fine. Genesis chapter 8, beginning around verse 20, and I will commence reading in verse 20 and end around verse 22. We're closing out this wonderful chapter as we're still in the midst of an incredible story that I think is so appropriate for our lives and our situations on today. Genesis chapter 8, verse 20, New Living Translation reads like this, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord 
They were sacrificed as burnt offerings to animals and birds that had been approved for the purpose. And the Lord was pleased with the aroma of the sacrifice and said to himself, I will never again curse the ground because of the human race. Even though everything they think or imagine is bent towards evil from childhood. I'll never again destroy all living things. As long as the earth remains, there will be planting and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night. Portion of verse 20 is what I want to focus on. It simply says, then Noah built an altar to the Lord. For a few moments, as we are centering ourselves and getting our hearts ready for revival, I want to preach from this thought today. I want to talk about build God an altar first. Lord, speak. Your people need to hear. I can imagine it had to be a tough moment. It had to be uh, this time for this person that has been upon this ark for 370 days. Can you imagine all the things that perhaps was going through the mind of Noah as he had to endure just some ups and some downs? These closed quarters of the ark had kept him and his family and animals safe, but you can imagine that they knew they were doing the right thing, but surely they were tired of being in the same space that they were in. Day after day, seeing the same walls. Day after day, seeing the same people. Day after day, experiencing the same smells and sounds of the animals. Now they've come to the moment where they have been patiently waiting. Now the ark has been settled on Mount Ararat. The door has been opened, and now we begin to see a freshness of a new day. Can you imagine as they peeked their heads outside of the door, they were able to inhale for the first time fresh air that is not so much infused from what they've been smelling in the ark. And there they are now, this soggy ground has now become dry, and I can see now Noah as he steps out, prepared for the first time in over 370 days, his body, his perspective, his family, and the animals are now able to disembark from the ark. It's been a long journey. I mean, they've had to endure this raging rainfall. They've had to endure the judgment of God. They had to endure the ridicule of even building the ark in the first place. And now they've come to the place where they get ready to experience the promises of God. God had promised that he would keep them. God had told Noah that if you would just do what I ask you to do, that I will make sure that you, your family, and what I have deemed to be safe will survive this onslaught and this flood. And now Noah gets to experience that. Can you imagine as he looks up in the sky, he sees the sun and he sees the clouds. And yes, even the rainbow, that's a reminder of the promises of God. And I can imagine that his family was probably thinking to Noah, well, we've been cooped up for 370 days. What should we do first? Let's go ahead and build some homes. We need a place to lay our head. We're tired of the small cots that we had to once again be on for the last 370 days on the ark. Or maybe some were saying to themselves, let's go and plant some, some fields. Let's grow something to eat. We need to get out. We, we have been cooped up for all this period of time. And I can imagine they were already trying to build their own checklist trying to say what is the next thing we should do we should experience the blessedness we're beyond this flood we're getting off this ark we are excited for what is next but in the midst of all that they see Noah do something strange Noah begins to meander around in the area that he stepped out on and what we begin to see is Noah goes, grabs these stones, he grabs these rocks, different sizes, but he's pushing them together. He is putting them into what only can be amounted as a, a mound of rocks, these stones he's gathering. And I can imagine those close to him were wondering what in the world was Noah doing? We got houses to build. We got plants we need to go and put in the ground. We got stuff we need to get together. We need to go ahead and develop our next normal. But Noah, in the midst of all that, as soon as he gets off the ark, he does not immediately run to build houses. He does not immediately plant things in the field. The text is clear. Noah builds an altar builds this place of worship. He builds this place of sacrifice. He builds this place that he gives God honor and homage for. And I want to submit for us as you have tuned in for this revival. I'm here to tell you uh, that I think that Noah gives you and I the prescription and the paradigm and the priorities for which we should have uh, that Noah teaches you and I that as we're preparing uh, to move into this next normal, as we're excited about getting through what we see as this ongoing pandemic uh, and I know you've got your plans together I know you've ready after a year and a half, but here is what Noah teaches you and I. Build God an altar first. 
that our first priority before we do anything else is to make sure that we recenter and reprioritize and reimagine our own possibilities and our relationship with God. I want to warn you, child of God, uh, that after all we have been through, after all the experiences, the pain, the upheaval, the political uncertainty, trying to figure out if we have still got to yell out that our lives matter, all the things we've had to endure over the last year and a half, please, ma'am, uh, please, sir, don't come through that and think that you put your yourself first be like Noah and build God an altar first I don't know who needs to hear this word today and I know you're frustrated and I know there has been tension but I want to suggest that we need to make sure that God becomes uh, the center of our reality there will be no success if we do not give altar to God first I'm talking to some family member that's been coming through this whole ordeal and I know it's been tough. Schools are, are reopening and I know you're ready to try to figure out what that next move should be. But I'm here to tell you, build God and altar first. I'm talking to some brother that's thinking to himself, here I am. I'm ready to move to that next side. I'm ready to move and get to this economic stability. But before you go ahead and make your business plan, build God and altar first. I know there's some church member that is ready to get back into the confines of in-person worship. And I know you're ready to get back in your pew. And I know you're ready to come and do what you have done before. But let me tell you, before we do all that, let's build God and altar first. This becomes our responsibility responsibility to make sure we prioritize God going forward and I think that that is a warning for us because I don't want us to skip steps I will admit to you that I know that you and your cousins in Georgia have oftentimes developed these new rituals these new routines I know I've heard it all I've heard people tell me that they don't have to do things like they've done before church is going to be different that the new normal is going to be vastly different from what we had before and I know there is tension for why our expectations and our routines but I'm here to tell you no matter what form church takes on going forward no matter what form your attendance begins to go in I need you to know that it will never succeed you will never be um prospering you will never have purpose if we do not put God at the center and at the first of what we try to do that's what I believe is the essence of this passage and Noah goes through this work and Pastor Patrick I want you to know he decides to build God an altar matter of fact if you read scripture this is the first time an altar is even mentioned that after all he's experienced the first thing that Noah does without any prompting from God is to build God an altar. He builds God something that had never been built before. And I think it's interesting that it comes after the flood. It comes after a period of quarantine that he decides to give God something he had never given God before. I need you to understand that as you and I are trying to move forward into this next normal, I need you to know that we must give God unprompted altars. We must make sure that when we come through what we're going through, that we don't give God what we had before, that this is not the season to try to give God a pre-COVID praise, but we need to build God a, a post-COVID altar. That's the reality of this passage. And I want to suggest if we begin to center ourselves and look at what this begins to look like in our lives, I believe that Noah gives you and I a template. He gives us some applicable principles, some life living lessons that allow us to understand the importance and significance of what this altar means to God. I, I got a few principles. Let me jot them out for you for a few moments. I hope that you put pen to parchment or perhaps you can type these in your note app on your phone. I, I need you to know that when you build God at an altar first, there are some things uh, that it provides for us in our relationship with God, uh, but also in our perspective of how we move uh, in God's plan. The first thing that I want you to know that Noah teaches us about building God an altar first is that number one, what it does is it creates an intimacy through personal sacrifice. What I'm here to argue is that when Noah begins to build this altar to God, it builds, watch this, it creates this moment of intimacy, this relational moment through personal sacrifice. But notice, as I stated, that Noah builds his altar. And I can imagine in my own mind, Pastor Patrick, I can see Noah's grabbing the various stones. He's never seen an altar built before, so something in his heart feels like he needs to do something that's so radically different than what he has done before. So he decides in his own will, in his own way, unprompted, to gather these rather large stones. Now, you can imagine these stones were not small. It has been cooped up for 370 days, so you can imagine this was not an easy task. That this was not going to be something that 
that was going to take a short while to, first of all, gather the stones and then to put the stones together in some kind of regimented way was going to take strategy. It was going to take know-how. It was going to take some blood and some sweat. This was going to take some work. But the text is clear that Noah is so in turn in making sure that God is honored that he's willing to do the hard work to build an altar to God. And I appreciate that about Noah. Because the truth of the matter is why some of us may not resonate with this message is to give God an altar means it's going to take some work. That it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be something that you can just wish will happen or hope will happen. It's going to take you rolling up your sleeves and doing the dirty work to make sure that you are creating and putting together something that honors God. Woe be unto us if we try to go into this new season, new season thinking that we're going to give God something easy. Perhaps we perhaps have got to the place where we want to just give God anything, but that's not what Noah is giving us the template for. Noah is is trying to let you and I know that it's going to be hard work building an altar to God. And I want you to understand why this blessed me too is notice that Noah built his own altar. He didn't commission his sons to come build the altar for him, no. He does not grab some animals and get them to help him gather the stones, no. That this moment Noah, realizing this was way I'm going to honor God, did not outsource his altar building. He decided to build the altar on his own. <laughs> and I love that because I will tell you one of my chief prayers as we're navigating this next normal, as we're moving into the place where God wants us to be, as God has kept us and protected us, my prayer for the modern church is that we have gotten out of the place before COVID came. We wanted other people to build our altars. We wanted our pastor to build our altar to God. We wanted the praise team to build our altar to God. And so uh, we became sideline participators, just sitting on the sideline uh, while the work was being done. Uh, but what I'm hoping uh, after we have disembarked from being quarantined in the ark like Noah is that we will not be relying on other people to build our altar. We will not be relying on other people to make us feel good or to make us feel happy that regardless of who's preaching, regardless of who's singing, regardless of who's in the sanctuary or in the cyber church, I made up my mind I'm going to bring my own stones I'm going to bring my own rocks and I'm going to build my own altar to God. Do I got any anybody at cyber church revival that says pg that sounds like what i need to do uh, that i've learned in the last year and a half uh, that i don't need much to give god glory regardless of where i sit regardless of the song being sung uh, i have come to the place to realize uh, that i have to bring my own stones uh, and build my own altar and i know there are people who are under the assumption that you need other people to make you feel good no what we've learned over the last year and a half is that if you got a praise and you got a memory and if you got your own stones, you can build your own altar. This is the season. You can't rely on other people to do the hard, necessary work for you. That, no, in our text, builds his own altar to God. But there's something else that happens here in this passage that is so interesting. Is that he doesn't just gather these stones. He does not just put them in a strategic place. no. The text is clear that he uses his altar, watch this, as a place to sacrifice. He grabs some of the animals that were, according to the text, had been set aside for the purpose of sacrifice and burnt them on the altar. Now here is where I believe, as I begin to navigate this particular passage, as my homiletical imagination takes over, I want to argue that the problem we have going forward is we must guard ourselves from trying to offer to God empty altars. See, you can build an altar, but if it's empty, it's no good. And I don't know about you, but I, I want to warn you. I don't want you building empty altars in this next norm. Because you can build an altar and have that altar be a monument, but altars were meant to be a place of sacrifice. Noah didn't just build an altar because it looked good. No, Noah built an altar because that was the place that he was going to sacrifice something for God. Which means that the altar building is for not, 
if one is not willing to sacrifice on that altar. In other words, what I build to God, I got to be willing to share and serve and to burn as a sacrifice to God. I think it's interesting when you begin to unpack the size of this sacrifice. It's interesting to note that he takes these animals, the ones that would have been on the ark with him. He places them on the, on the altar and burns them. Matter of fact, some scholars have suggested this is one of the most liberal offerings in all of Scripture. We don't get in totality how many he burned, but he burned an awful lot of animals on that altar. And I know, I know, I can imagine that perhaps his children, maybe even his wife, perhaps looked at Noah a little funny, thinking to themselves, why are you burning those animals? We could have used them for food. We could have used them for a supply. But Noah understood that in this season that I cannot consume what's meant to be sacrificed. That, that I've got to make sure that I'm providing for God something that shows him how much God means to me. I know there's going to be a tendency going forward to lessen one sacrifice. That after all we've been through, I know the excuses are going to be said, well, I haven't had employment for a while. Or... I've been quarantined for a year and a half or any other kind of excuse. But what I appreciate about Noah is he understood what amongst him was purpose for the sacrifice. And he was going to serve that up to God no matter how much it cost him. Can I tell you, I need to ask you the critical question. How much does your sacrifice for God cost? How much does your heart and your relationship and the way you think about God, is it reach the level of your sacrifice? See, some of us want to put a few on the altar and think that's appropriate. But notice in our text, Noah just gave God the most liberal and generous offering that he could. I need you to know, if we're going to honor God the way that God should be honored, is we've got to give an unusual, generous sacrifice. And I want to tell you what I appreciate about the text. Notice that Noah didn't have to go look for a sacrifice. But the things that had kept him company on the ark for 370 days, it was out of that portion that he was able to use as a sacrifice in this new season. Is it possible? That God has been preserving some things in your journey over the last year and a half. That at this new moment, once he is disembarking you from the ark, he's saying that what kept you in the ark should now be sacrificed on the altar. And maybe for many of us who've been trying to look here and look there, talking about you don't have uh, what it takes. What if I told you, you got everything you need uh, to offer God a sacrifice. You got everything you need uh, in your proximity and around you uh, to honor God. I need you to know, child of God, uh, that everything you need uh, to offer up to God, uh, God has already given you access to. Uh, The question is, are you going to sacrifice it or not? And how you view God is what the level of your sacrifice. If God is small, then it should be a small sacrifice. God is medium, it should be a medium sacrifice. But I think I'm talking to some people that know how grand and large our God is. That's seeing God do some incredible things. That's amazed that yes, it's been a hard year and a half, but God is a keeper. God has sustained you. God has strengthened you. God has comforted you. And because of what God has done for me, I'm going to be like Noah and give God my absolute best sacrifice. And I want you to know, you can't sacrifice what your pastor has. It's going to be your own sacrifice. You can't, you can't sacrifice what mom and daddy had No. You're going to have to sacrifice your own. And the beauty of this passage is not only did Noah build his own altar, but he brought his own sacrifice. King Cyrus had caught a Persian prince. He caught him and caught them and his prince and his family and brought him in front of him. Literally what would happen is King Cyrus at this moment would execute the family because that was his way of trying to gain leverage and ownership of the places that he had conquered. But as a way of sport, he brought the prince in front of him and he decided to go through a bartering game with the prince. And King Cyrus asked the prince, he said, Prince, what if I, if I spared your life, how much would you give me? He said, I'll give you half of my possessions. He said, all right, well, well, what if I spared your children? He said, I'll give you 
all of my possessions. He said, well, what if you spared, what if I spared your wife? He said, I'll give you myself. King Cyrus was so amazed and so taken aback by the answer of the prince, he released the prince, his wife, and his children. As they were getting ready to release and be gone, and the prince remarked to his wife, what a beautiful man King Cyrus must have been. Look, look how beautiful he is. His grace and his mercy extended towards us. Where his wife said, I'll be honest with you. I didn't notice how the prince looked because I was so busy looking at you, the one who sacrificed everything for me. Child of God, I want God to look at me like the wife of the prince looked at him. I want God to smile upon me because he knows I'm someone that's willing to sacrifice for him. I want God to beam from ear to ear as he looks down from the thrones of heaven because he knows that I'm someone that's willing to get intimate and to get close and to sacrifice because I know how good God has been. When you build God an altar, God, build him an altar first, you create intimacy through personal sacrifice. But there's something else we see around verse 21 that lets you and I know that we build God an altar first because here's the no number two living principle is that it highlights grace through divine pardon. This text is powerful to me because not only do we see this altar being built, but there are some responses to this construction project of Noah. Verse 21 tells us in this passage of scripture, note what it says. It says, and the Lord was pleased with the aroma of the sacrifice. Said to himself, I will never again curse the ground because of the human race. Even though everything they think or imagine is bent toward evil from childhood. I will never again destroy all living things. This is important and very practical and a real amazing theological moment in scripture for me. It is here that this sacrifice has such a turn and change that the Bible tells us, it gives us this anthropomorphic language. It, it illustrates to us that, that this altar that Noah built, this sacrifice that he burns, it, it makes its way, watch this, to the nostrils of God. Can you see as God takes a deep breath of this sacrifice? He smells in the burnt aroma of the sacrifice. And through this moment, through this, this burnt sacrifice, this aroma in his nostrils, the text says, watch this, that God begins to have a conversation with God's self. That while Noah is altering, offering at the altar, God begins this conversation, actually a conference call between God's self. And God comes up with the idea that because of the sacrifice of Noah, I made up my mind, I'm never again going to curse them. I'm not going to curse the ground so the ground will never be cursed anymore, which means that their labor will work. And I will never kill all living beings again. I've decided that I'm going to relent from that. Never again am I going to cause calamity at this level of catastrophe to fall the earth. And all that happens because of the smell of the aroma of the sacrifice from Noah's altar. Noah's altars is the one that perhaps is the thing that caused God to relent. God made a decision that I'm going to change my mind. Oh, when I read verse 21, my soul got happy to know that we serve a God that can be shifted and swayed by the intensity of our sacrifice. I'm glad to know that we serve a God that has our best interests at heart. God is so incredible. That even in poignant periods after what we've endured for quite a long time, God says, guess what? I'm going to make sure things are good for you. Ground won't be cursed no more and, and no living beings will, will be killed. I'll never have this level of catastrophe again. This is a powerful image. God shares with you and I this important moment that God realizes I'm going to extend something to you uh, that you can't get yourself. I'm the one. That's going to make sure the ground prospers. I'm the one that's going to cover and protect life. I'm doing that because of the worship of Noah. And I would tell you, if that was just it, I would shout myself silly. I, I would go into my seat. But there was a part of verse 21 that I must admit caused me a little apprehension and tension. Because the text says that God smells the aroma. He makes his mind up. I'm, I'm not going to curse the ground. I'm not going to kill all human beings. But then he says something that grabbed my attention. He says, even though humanity is evil 
in all of its ways from birth. I, I was struck by this, this little footnote in verse 21, because on one hand, I'm rejoicing, but on the other hand, I'm confused. Uh, on one hand, I am grateful, but on the other hand, I am perplexed. I'm perplexed because at this point, after the flood, after Noah has been disembarked from the ark, God has changed his mind. He no longer wants to provide judgment on the entire world. Notice that even though God changes, he makes the declaration that humanity has not changed. Because if you remember, one of the reasons why God had to start everything over, the reason why he had to send the flood and instruct the righteous man by the name of Noah to build an ark is because of the evil that was inside of humanity how they had lost their way and were no longer faithful to God. It was that main tenet that we see, which was the precipice, which was the reason why he instructed Noah to build an ark, why he sent the flood 40 days and 40 nights, and why Noah, his family, and those upon the ark had to languish for over 300 some days. Now they've got off the ark. Sky is clear, and God has now decided no longer will I curse the ground, and no longer will I permeate or, or destroy humanity. But the same reason that he caused the flood, that same issue is still there. And I wrestled with this because I wanted to know, God, what has changed? I mean, if you started out doing this because of the evil that was within humanity and that evil is now still present, you are admitting it that even though Noah and his family are the only people on earth that you're still admitting the proclivities of humanity, you're still trying to say that even our most righteous ones still have evil imaginations within. God, what has changed? And God said, Goodman, understand, I know how you are, and I know how humanity can be, and I know no matter what I've done and no matter what I try to do, there's something I just can't root out of you. So I understand since you ain't going to change, I'm going to change. Since, since you are going to have what you have on the inside of you, I'm going to be a God that my mercy is going to be greater than your mistakes. My grace is going to be greater than your prejudices. I want you to know that I'm a God that extends things to you even when you don't deserve it. And I know someone that's listening to me can recall that humanity seems uh, to be losing its everlasting mind. Let's be honest. It seems uh, after the last year and a half, I mean, we can just go ahead uh, and run down the list. Uh, I mean, political uncertainty. Uh, it seems as if we can't get things together on one end. Uh, and so that's a problem of the evil within uh, humanity. Not only the political landscape, uh, but even the economic uncertainty as we see a culture that no longer wants to help those uh, on the ostracized, those on the margins. Uh, that no longer do we want to uh, we have taken people over prophets uh, that's a sign uh, of the evil within our hearts and uh, even when it comes to racial injustice it's a shame uh, that we as a black community have to keep declaring simply that our lives matter and whenever we say those things uh, it's always got pushback it's always seemed like it's something else uh, and that's the struggle that we deal with humanity is not going to change but here's the good news shout of God uh, God still changes God uh, understands in our wreckedness, uh, in our planes, uh, and our proclivities, even on our worst day, God's mercy is still greater than all that. And somebody ought to look back over your life, because I know I gave you the societal sins, uh, but you can run the laundry list of your individual sins, uh, how you've done stuff day in uh, and day out. You ain't treated everybody right. You ain't dotted every I, and you ain't crossed every T. Uh, but one thing I can shout about every single day uh, is God's grace uh, and God's mercy. Mercy is still available. God uh, still provides them for me. Uh, even when I've done so wrong, God says, I'll provide for you. I, I won't curse the ground and, and I won't destroy humanity. That's what happened one day. This mother stood there, fell at the feet of King Napoleon. There you can see to her left was her condemned son. He had been caught in an act that required his life. Not just once, but twice. And there he was, back beaten and bruised. His arms were in shackles. And the executioner was there, preparing to take down the blade to sever his head from his body. And his mother came and she fell at the feet of Napoleon. And she said, please, sir, give my son mercy. Napoleon said, 
Woman, get on your feet. He doesn't deserve mercy. He was caught not once, not twice, doing an act that he deserves to lose his life. We should go ahead and get rid of him. He's a scourge. This man deserves no mercy. And that's where the mother looked up, tears cascading down her face. She looked right there square in the eyes of Napoleon. She said, you're right. He doesn't deserve mercy. But if it was mercy was deserved, none of us would ever have mercy. Mercy is not something that you deserve. Mercy is something that's been given. And child of God, Napoleon heard that request from that mother tear, came down his eye. He released that son uh, because he responded to the mercy claim uh, of that mother. Can I tell you, uh, if Napoleon could do that same thing back then, uh, how much do you think God uh, extends mercy to you and I? It's not that we've done right. It's not that we've been perfect, but God extends his grace uh, and his mercy that even on our worst day, God's best is still exemplified. We build God an altar first because he creates intimacy through personal sacrifice. We build God an altar first because it highlights grace through divine pardon. There's one last living principle I want to share with you tonight. And that's what I want to share in this, this third principle that I want to highlight as we look at Act Genesis chapter 8, verse 22. It simply all closes by saying it establishes covenant through changing seasons. It's interesting. Verse 22 is where we see the concluded and climax of this small pericope. Notice what it says right there. At as long as the earth remains, watch this, there will be planting and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night. Remember, the altar was built and sacrifices were made in verse 20. The response to that was God's grace and mercy being established. But then verse 22, it ends with a promise. God tells Noah through this moment of worship that I'm going to give you a promise that as long as the earth remains, there's going to be seed time and harvest time, day and night, cold and heat, summer and winter. Here, God establishes a consistent way that he's telling Noah from this point forward, there are some things you're going to bank on, and that is the fact that seasons will change. I, I, I will admit, my brothers and sisters, quite an interesting thing for God to promise. I mean, who would think that change in seasons would be an establishment of covenant? But I, I want to argue, as I prepare to close this message, is that these changing seasons were significant because it began to establish some things that Noah and you and I could bank on going forward that it's the promise that God provides when we prioritize God. He says that as long as the earth remains, there's going to be these seasons, these seasons of seed time, harvest time, day and night, cold and heat and winter and summer. Now, I want to argue that these seasons are important because first thing he lets us know is that it causes you and I to make sure that we strategize in every season. God has given you and I the plan. He says, I want you to know that there's some things you can count on, that it's going to be planting and harvest, cold and heat, day and night, winter and summer, which means I'm going to control the seasons, but you have to control how you work in the seasons. That I need you to make sure that you are discerning enough that you know how to navigate and strategize as the seasons come. Woe be unto us, child of God, if we don't see the seasons and experience the seasons, but don't maximize the seasons we're in. That's why you got to make sure when it's seed time, you're not ready for harvest. But when it's harvest time, you're not planting the seed. That's why you got to make sure that when it's winter, you got on the right clothes. And when it's summer, you know it's time to do what you need to do. You know, child of God, when it's night, it's time to rest. And when it's day, it's time to work. What he tells you and I is I'm controlling the seasons, but I need you to have the wherewithal and the fortitude and the discernment to maximize every season. That's why, child of God, 
We got to be careful as we're meandering and moving forward into the next normal that we do not underestimate our own seasons. God is telling you, I'm going to control the seasons, uh, but you control uh, how you manage them, which means uh, we must make sure that we are discerning enough to know uh, the best course of action uh, in the various seasons that we're in uh, because the seasons provide uh, the tempo of our lives. They provide uh, the way that we should operate when things are going, that I've got to make sure that I have my nose to the ground uh, and my ear to God's heart uh, because I need to know how to manage uh, when it's daytime. Uh, I need to know how to manage uh, when it's nighttime. I need to know how to manage when it's summer and winter. I need to know how to manage when it's seed time and harvest. I need to make sure that I'm managing the changing season that's ahead of us. And I want you to know that if we're going to maximize them, you got to be prepared for every season, which means that at the end of the day, we can't complain when it's cold. We just got to be ready. We can't complain when it's winter. We just got to be ready. We got to make sure that we are maximizing and strategizing and being fruitful and productive in every season. So we got to strategize these seasons. But I got good news as I close that we also got to learn how to survive every season because there's bad news and there's good news. Let me give you the bad news first. Life comes in seasons. Well, let me give you the good news. Life comes in seasons. I know I told you, you got to strategize and discern. But notice what he says in the passage. Don't miss it. You're going to have seed time and harvest. You're going to have winter and summer, day and night, cold and heat. Did you see it? What he's basically saying is that, yes, you're going to have to learn how to navigate changing seasons. But what he's also telling you and I is that seasons don't last always. <laughs> Oh, I know it's hard sometimes when you're seemingly stuck in a perpetual seed time season. And I know it gets difficult when you seem to find yourself in winter season. And I know it gets hard when it's cold and it's night. But the good news that God provides for you and I is no longer how long it feels seed time is, no matter how long and cold winter may be, and no matter the frigidness of our cold, and no matter the length of our night. Here's the good news. Seed time always going to break. Because harvest time is on the way. That even though winter may be harsh and it may be frigid, we still got summer on the way. Cold may be there and the temperature may be spiking, but we'll always have some heat coming around the corner. And yes, even though the night may be for a while, the shout that you and I can have is that day is coming. And that's the good news I want to leave you with, Covenant, is I need you to understand that no matter what season we've endured, and we've had some cold seasons. Uh, we've had some winter time. Uh, and we've had what felt like an elongated night. The good news about God's goodness uh, and God's promise uh, is that seasons don't last always. Uh, that no matter how much we've endured, uh, God says I can break open and move you from night to day. Uh, from cold to heat. Uh, from winter to summer. Uh, and seed time to harvest time. Uh, and that's the good news I'm leaving you with. Uh, is I need you to know covenant. Uh, as you and I prepare for the next normal is we got a God that can change our seasons. He can move us from good times to bad times, from bad times to good times, and good times to better times. He can change our seasons from virtual to in person, from up, from down to up. We got a God that can change our seasons. And that's why you and I can come to this moment and still celebrate because no matter what season we're in, we trust that God's goodness will always surround us. Maybe that's what Paul Jones meant when he declared why he won't complain. He said, I won't complain because I had some good days. I've had some bad days. I've had some heels to climb. But now when I look around and I think things over, my good days outweigh my bad days. And I made up my mind that I won't, I won't complain complain. So goodbye covenant. May the Lord bless you real good. But here's my prayer that each of us do in this next normal. Build God an altar first. Do what is necessary to reprioritize God in our next normal. My brothers and sisters, I'm done. But I need you to understand that in this next season, before you move from the ark to something else, Build God an altar. 
as we're navigating this next normal, as we're trying to figure out how we can come out safely, as we're trying to navigate what it's going to look like in this pandemic and beyond, no matter what happens, no matter what the timeline may be, build God an altar first. Make sure that you give God something you didn't give him before. This is a new season for unprompted altars. This is a new time for us to offer up to God something we've never done before. Covenant, that's my prayer for you. That in this new season, give God something you never gave him before. Give God an altar. I want to pray with you. I'm asking God's grace and God's strength would keep you and sustain you. I pray that as y'all navigate just like everyone else, what the next normal is going to look like, I pray that you keep God first. I pray for your pastor and the leadership. No matter the methodology, no matter the COVID-19 protocols we got to go through, we keep God first. No matter what happens with people's attendance routines, no matter the things we're going to have to keep or not keep in ministry, no matter what services we have to come to, we're not certain about all that. But one thing I'm certain of, keep God first. They're not only first in our church, but I want to argue also, keep them first in our lives. Because let's be honest, we've allowed the pandemic and many things we've experienced and seen to oftentimes frustrate us to the point that we've kept our eyes off God. We spend more time trying to chase down the latest information concerning this and concerning that. But here I hear God saying, just return back to me. Prioritize me. Create these new possibilities of everything that can be if you just center me. And I hope that's for us. That through everything we've experienced, through the things that have caused so much pain and suffering, that if God has kept us through this, we owe God an altar. God, we thank you and we bless you. It is our prayer that you would keep us. I thank you for this church. I pray for covenant. So navigating this next normal. I thank you again for their willingness to stay plugged in, to sacrifice and support. I pray, God, that you would also corporately allow us to make sure that we keep the main thing the main thing. Methodologies may change, but the mission never changes. So, Lord, I lift up this amazing pastor. I pray for Pastor Patrick. I pray for him and his vision, his voice. Continue to make sure that he keeps you first, God. I pray, God, that he leads in these uncertain times. Give him strength and clarity. Give him the ability to just trust you every step of the way. Pray for his family. And I pray also for this leadership team here at Covenant. And I pray that you will continue to undergird them, guide them and lead them in all of their decisions. And God, continue to keep them as they do their best to lead this incredible congregation. Now, God, you've, you've commissioned us for revival. There's other voices we're going to hear. So, God, I pray that you in tune their voices to our hearts because our aim, God, is not just be hearers of your word, but be doers of your word. And we understand through the midst of this, it doesn't matter what happens in the building, God, but, Lord, create in us a sanctuary, tried and true. So, Lord, I speak revival over this house. I pray, God, that your manifested presence would show up in every area of their lives. And God, we trust you because we know that once we put you first, you'll handle everything else. So God, we're going to give you our best and give you our all. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. God bless you. Wow, was that not an incredible word to begin our relaunch revival. Thank you so much, Pastor Goodman, for pouring into us on tonight in such a special way. And I know you know somebody who needs to hear that word. So we invite you to share this word, like this word, share this message on the platform you are watching. The way the algorithms work, it's your liking and sharing that allows this to reach the masses. We encourage you to invite two people to tune in on next week as we keep going higher and higher. Listen, if you're not connected to Christ and you're not connected to a church home, we want to make sure you make that connection tonight. Maybe you're out of connection. 
and you want to get reconnected, you can call us at 708-333-5955 and let us know that you're interested in getting that relationship with Jesus Christ and the church on track. You can text the phrase JOIN CUCC to 84576. Again, thank you, Pastor Goodman. We have another great preacher joining us next Tuesday. Make sure you tune in at 7 p.m. This is Pastor Patrick Damon. We love you in the Lord. We love you to life. God bless you. Thank you.